Good morning, everybody. My name is Luca Bono. I'm an electrochemical chemist, and today I am the chairman of this section that will be more, maybe from some aspect, more interesting comparing batteries and powertrain. Electric vehicles have, uh, in some way, have developed uh, largely in the recent years. And, but first and second generation has been mainly focused on the battery and power for, for the propulsion system. Now, with this third generation of electric vehicles, the architecture of the old system have taken the leap, starting from uh, endothermic uh, structure, and now more suitable for electric vehicles. So we will learn a little more as other systems are integrated in, uh, in the coming generation of electric vehicles. First pitch will be engineer Giovanni Stefani. With the learning from past experience, electric vehicle first generation. He spent uh, 30 years uh, in one of the main firms uh, of the super sport cars uh, in the world, and now he moved as uh, head of system integration, Rimac and uh, Bugatti. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, sorry. Well, in order to evaluate better what I'm trying to say as I change uh, the way to present something, otherwise it's the same story, electrical, electrical, I see, okay. My experience coming from a diesel engine for nine, nine years, my product is uh, already in the market, it means uh, I'm a very lucky guy because I've made uh, some good engine. Okay, then I'm going in Ferrari Auto in order to make uh, the what we call uh, concept. Uh, is uh, the first part of the project of the car. I spent 30 years in that and uh, one of my first work is uh, about uh, the 360 Maserati Quattro Porte, La Ferrari means, uh, okay, that is my first work. Then in the end of my career in Ferrari, I'm working in a prototype in order to make the innovation in a prototype, because uh, simulation is a good word, but when you make the choice, uh, take the right choice is difficult. Then spend a lot of money for to make a prototype. I'm also uh, on the energy generator and uh, some other part of a vacuum cleaner and a coffee machine, but also for that I'm a specialist in a patent. The patent is very important, taking account that uh, in order to see what is a patent, the patent is not uh, the feature and uh, function, it's the way to make this feature. Means uh, looking for the patent everywhere because there is an idea and the idea must be changed. Also for that reason, I'm a specialist uh, to uh, make a bypass on a patent. That is important also for any part of a product. Okay, what we can speak about the third generation of uh, vehicle, uh, e-vehicle uh, is uh, not a new phases, is evolution of the phases. Now we are going fastly in electrical vehicle for uh, several reasons. Not one of that reason is uh, really good, really right, but uh, the political pressure, the industrial thinking is going in that direction means we must think in that direction. Otherwise we are we could have uh, a wrong way for our future. And uh, what does mean uh, change a car from uh, traditional to the new one? The new one for sure have uh, some simplification. For sure, from a point of view of, uh, of a layout, okay? But uh, if uh, the electrical vehicle can make some opportunity of uh, more packaging flexibility, okay? Uh, we can think also what does it mean in terms of real, real feasibility of a car, because uh, it's easy to say uh, is more simple, but it's not true, okay? The electrical car is more complex. First, because uh, there is no history inside of uh, any car manufacturer. We are growing very fastly. And the problem to make a car stay the same, okay? The 80% of complexity of the car is the same 
of uh, the old uh, complexity. Um, some concept very important if I wanted to push you to think uh, to the new product uh, as coming from a new concept means uh, to think in different paradigm of our car where we need uh, to evaluate some change to justify the enormous cost of develop and uh, the cost for a customer. This is absolutely too much. I cannot think to pay 40,000 euro for one car, okay? Only because it's electrical. Then spend more for to drive this car compared to the traditional one. Means the car must be think more thinking to the customer and change the offer to the customer. Make some kind of surprise in the market, okay? And uh, in order to obtain better result, uh, we need uh, to take in account absolutely more simulation by virtual point of view, but also think to innovation in terms of feature of the car. Okay. And uh, that is only one way to justify the different uh, uh, performance coming from uh, electrical vehicle. I'm uh, speaking from uh, my work is uh, Rimash. Rimash is uh, 2,000 horsepower of car fully electric is uh, uh, impossible to drive because it's too fast. What does it mean? That is one way of thinking, but it's not a car for everybody. The people must use the car, cannot pay the car too much, okay? You need to, to put some new message, new, new feature. Hmm. First is uh, the uh, autonomy of the car. You cannot drive an electrical car without thinking uh, where is the next uh, step for to make a charge, or thinking to the fast charge only. What is important, uh, as an example, to take in your mind is uh, the mobile phone. Okay, few years ago, not one thing uh, to charge a mobile phone in, a, in after two weeks. Normally, it's two weeks, 15 days. Okay, but with the two feature, phone and SMS only. Okay. Now the phone have a lot of feature, more feature than we know, okay? And every day you need to, to, to charge. And the, we have changed our habit because the feature is better. We must think in the same way for a car. Consumption then is important. What does mean? Autonomy means battery capacity, means battery weight. And when we speak about battery weight, and battery capacity, we need to speak about the real autonomy. Not only when you are in a, in a normal weather, but for example, in a winter. Okay, in a winter, the level of capacity or real um, autonomy lose 44% of a real kilometer. And for that, you must grow a little bit the capacity of the battery, means more weight. At the same power, at the same car, hybrid car lose 50, 20 percent of energy only because it's more weight. Then the weight of the battery is important. The capacity and the weight and reliability. In the end, the main important point for a future, I say for today, for engineer, is to take the right compromise between consumption performance and what coming from the packaging, because good packaging allow you to make the better use of a space than new feature on a car. Remember the phone, more feature. Consumption coming from efficiency for sure, from an e-motor and battery. And that is easy to say, but it's very hard work to do because there is no story. The people are learning now, okay? The new material could help uh, us uh, to make the right compromise between the cost of that and the performance. Then, important element, uh, to have a right dimension, a right uh, technology on e-motor and the battery is very important. Then uh, for a car manufacturer to define the right uh, correct target definition, we cannot uh, achieve uh, some target because it is a target of Nevera or the target of uh, Tesla, okay, we must understand which is our target. The right compromise between the performance and the target is one key factor of success, especially for the weight. Uh, 
for to reduce the weight and to have a big good opportunity for the next 20 years because uh, the market of the battery don't go down in terms of price and weight very fast is think to the range extender and speak about the range extender also thinking to the other fuel like hydrogen or something like that that is very important okay that means also the battery chemistry could be the right one for the right car and the new battery technology means change from a lithium to uh, oxidized on palm other okay battery is very important that is uh, difficulties of today for an uh, electrical vehicle that is uh, what we can uh, push the reduction of weight the measuring cost of a car but uh, the difficulty to make a car is not only the consumption it's also the weight we must design for the weight easy to say not easy to do the first important point is for sure the battery again the system and the performance of the car and his optimization is a very, very important element to define the target. And that means a simulation monodimensional okay, or three-dimensional, but taking account the strategic word about that is the system engineer with the model of simulation very, very, very evolutive. Then another important point is the new functionality in the car. Again, think to the mobile phone. Okay. We needed to put inside the car something new, something different, something more, more advanced. Not because advanced is better, because change your vision of a car. That is one way to justify the normal cost of a battery again. Uh, that don't lose also another important point is uh, uh, the affidability, reliable part of a function we have in electronics, because the car, someone said, uh, is 44% of a uh, of a effort of a car manufacturer. No, no, is uh, more than 70%. Uh, from my point of view, you can make a car reliable if you have a good electronics, especially in, in a control. Uh, the architectural domain is a key feature for the future. The most uh, uh, money spent for a developer for every car manufacturer is on electronics, only electronics. Mechanics is easy because we know already in which way we can have something realable. Another important point is to think to the feature by electronics where you can update the feature and functionality of your car easily. Okay, every year, not you have a car of 10 years and is old. You have one car of one year, you can update the software. That means another way to manage the operating system of a car. And his reliability. The connectivity for sure is important. You know how much that is uh, the first problem today for any car, especially electrical vehicle. Don't lose other point. Uh, every car manufacturer don't think that to one important point is uh, uh, electromagnetic compatibility wing. I speak about uh, not only if uh, the uh, ECU and ECU have uh, reliability, but the effect uh, on a driver. There is a very big problem. In the next future, I'm thinking about one, two years, uh, there is an ICNIRP okay, recommendation. And with the actual car in the market, we, ha we have a situation out of the law. When that become a law, any car have a problem. I'm speaking about uh, the low frequency, the high frequency effect in uh, your body. And that is something to change in your mind for a third generation. Design of a car, think into an electromagnetic field. And last, but is more important, the cost. The cost must go down. The cost of today for an electrical vehicle is not correct, is not right for a market. What we can do for to evaluate the evolution everywhere is uh, what I can call uh, needs a consumption. Okay, I will say uh, 1D simulation model for to go deeply in a right evolution, right, but a, a right evolution, uh, sorry, um, compromise between one feature and another feature. 
how much is uh, the needs from a battery, how much is the need from uh, e-motors. And thinking that uh, not only for a uh, theoretical, okay, although at the limit, but uh, wait a, a little bit more better the feature of a car. That uh, go to reduction of a consumption, okay? Oh, well, I go very fast. Uh, Okay, weight, material. Reduction of weight is a key feature for sure. Okay, sorry if I jump a little bit because I must go forward. Uh, use of the correct uh, material can help you to reduce the 10% of the weight of a part. Use of possible integration feature. Use of the same element for different uh, work can reduce other 10%. Okay, but have a correct architecture, correct choice where you put the, peop uh, the, the element and the right uh, concept of that uh, can reduce the weight of the car to the 30% compared to the wrong car, for sure, for sure, okay? That is number real. The result of this number is, for example, La Ferrari. La Ferrari in the beginning was uh, more than 40% of weight uh, like we have done in the first part of the project. And that is a result from our experience. Uh, I go forward fastly because, okay, in the end, the factor of success of an electric vehicle is uh, to have a simple car, simple architecture. That is uh, something to take as a choice from the beginning. Have a synergy by the component, okay? And that means uh, to have uh, the strong, involvement of the supplier because not one know everything okay if we make the right choice on a supplier from the beginning of a work we can drive the right choice in architecture and that is very important point modular battery okay a way to obtain the reduction of cost and the improving of the quality and when change the chemistry, change the battery. That means uh, use a modular battery. Sometimes triangular form can help you to have a good uh, solution in terms of uh, uh, stiffness of the body. And uh, as I've said before, okay, surprising the customer, thinking to what will be the needs uh, of the customer. That ca characterizes your product and your success. And uh, the least, but it's very important, the HMI, the interface between the people and the car is very important. Well, I finish, I'm going out of the time, okay. Just close. <laughs> right, okay. The picture is very important. Hmm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni. Uh, please keep your questions on hold for a while and uh, we will have a five minute section in the middle of this uh, part of the conference and uh, I would welcome Steve Lambert from McLaren Applied he is the head of electrification Steve uh, own a engineering doctorate from uh, Woki University and he has spent uh, and made experience, spent a lot of time and made a lot of experience developing prototypes, both hybrid, electric, and uh, also some experience in Formula One electrification. Today he is the strategic head of uh, McLaren Applied and he is also chairman of uh, AZIN. Uh, which is an organization, an initiative from a UK uh, country in order to promote and consolidate the value chain, we can say that, yeah. the value chain around the electrification uh, market. Steve will talk about uh, the high power electronics, talking about uh, the silicon carbide uh, new components in the 800 volts uh, uh, for the 800 volts batteries. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Luca. 
And good morning everybody. So I'm going to talk about high performance 800 volt silicon carbide inverters for automotive applications. The next step in electrification. Firstly, you might be wondering who McLaren Applied are. What I'll say is we're not McLaren Racing. We don't make racing cars. We're not McLaren Automotive. We don't make supercars. We're McLaren Applied. We're a technology and products company. So we develop products that we take out and put into the marketplace that OEMs can then go and buy and integrate into their vehicles. So we don't do consultancy, we do products. We've been working in the automotive industry since, uh, oh, it's, it's lost the number on there, but that should say, I think, 1993. I think it's 1993 when we did the electronics for the original McLaren F1, which was the three-seater supercar back in the day. Um, we still produce those, uh, those parts for those cars to keep them on the road. Um, but that was sort of our first introduction into the automotive world. Um, we then adopted world-class automotive standards with the McLaren Mercedes vehicles that uh, McLaren produced. Um, and then actually in 2008, we started developing our safety critical engineering competence um, for an aerospace FADEC that we developed for a customer. So there are aeroplanes flying around at the moment with McLaren controllers in them. So we do very high safety reliability components. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the McLaren P1 in a minute, but we, we've been working in automotive for quite a while and we focus on power electronics and safety critical components. But what I want to talk about are the key trends and issues for EV development for OEMs. When we look at the key trends, we can see the EV product volumes are rapidly increasing. You can't go into a um, dealership without seeing electric vehicle there. All, all of the OEMs have electric vehicles now. And what we're starting to see is improving powertrain efficiency is going to be key to the competitiveness of these vehicles. So how efficient your powertrain is will be very, very important. We're seeing EV infrastructure changing and improving. However, charge and range anxiety and cost remain the common concern for consumers. And actually, really, the thing to focus here is on not range anxiety. The range of electric vehicles is, is more or less OK now. You get 200, 300 miles from a vehicle. It's charge anxiety. How quickly? Can I charge my electric vehicle? That, that's becoming the key question. And so the issues we see is cost. This technology is expensive, it's new, and so it's expensive. It can be heavy and difficult to package, so weight and packaging. Range, again, range and chargeability is very important. But actually thermal management, and by thermal management I mean efficiency again. So efficiency is going to become a key player in how we develop electric vehicles for the future. And then reliable. Any technology needs to be reliable and robust. And we believe that the McLaren applied 800 volt silicon carbide inverter addresses these issues. But you might ask yourself, why silicon carbide? Well, firstly, what is silicon carbide? It's a switching technology used in the inverter, which is the motor controller. Um, the switch is more efficiently than IGBT, the current technology in most electric vehicles. These two graphs here show that actually silicon carbide not only being more efficient, actually when you look at it from a system point of view is more cost effective, particularly where you have a larger battery pack size. So where you have a higher efficiency drivetrain, you can get more range out of your battery pack or conversely you have a smaller battery pack for the same range. So driving efficiency makes your vehicle more cost effective, particularly where you have a larger battery pack. That's the graph on the left. The graph on the right shows EV battery capacity versus motor power. So it, it's sort of the, the axes are slightly different, but what you see is you don't get many, um, many vehicles in the not cost effective section. There aren't many vehicles with 350 kilowatts of motor, but only a 40 or 60 kilowatt hour battery. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. So actually for the majority of electric vehicles, silicon carbide, although being more expensive as a technology, is the most cost-effective option when you've integrated that technology into your vehicle. And what we're starting to see is the EV industry reaching an inflection point and starting to realize that. So the graph on the left-hand side shows the um, uptake of uh, passenger EVs, the blue line. 
The green line shows a forecast of those vehicles that we use silicon IGBTs in their inverters. And the red line is a forecast of those that will use silicon carbide uh, MOSFETs in their inverters. And what we can see is sometime around the middle of this decade, this one may be a little optimistic, this, this analysis, but actually the majority of vehicles will be using silicon carbide in their drivetrain. And the reason goes back to the previous slide is because ultimately it's more cost effective and you get a better vehicle. And we can start to see that on the right hand side where we're moving to 800 volts. Um, I don't know if you can read that, it's slightly small, but the Lucid Air is using 900 volts. Jaguar Land Rover have an 800 volt platform. Um, Hyundai and Porsche, of course, already have 800 volt vehicles in the market. And so the headwinds are well known. 800 volt and silicon carbide is the future of automotive electric vehicles. We can also see that when we look at. Um, um, things that people have said. So we've got Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors, saying um, we're all in on electrification. The inflection point for our company has arrived. Uh, Aston Martin saying they'll launch their first BEV in 2025. Uh, Mate Rimac has said they focused on 800 volt from the beginning. Um, Bentley, you know, Bentley luxury vehicles, not necessarily what you might think of for electrification. Think that electrification and Bentley are the perfect partners. Um, even Ford commercial vehicles will all be zero emissions capable by 2024. Um, and, and just bringing back on that tipping point um, and the, the inflection point, uh, McKinsey and company are saying actually we're now at that tipping point for electrification. It's not, gonna, it's not going to happen in the future. We are there now. Electrification is happening now when we're at that point where it's going to rapidly accelerate. And so what are McLaren Applied doing? Well, we're looking at 800 volt silicon carbide inverters. Our inverter journey, uh, we started off developing inverters and the motors for the McLaren P1. That was the world's first hybrid supercar. I believe we beat the uh, Ferrari LaFerrari by about two weeks getting to market. Uh, but it was the world's first hybrid supercar and that was our Gen 1 inverter. That was 120 kilowatts, IGBT, uh, went into production in 2013. We then worked with that same technology in Formula E and that became the standard technology for all vehicles in Formula E in the first season. So all vehicles ran that inverter. And because it was developed in automotive and then taken into motorsport, it was completely reliable for those Formula E teams in year one of Formula E. But with an increased power up to 170 kilowatts. We then increased it again to 200 kilowatts once we learned a bit more and then brought it back into a production automotive application in 2019 at 230 kilowatts. But what you can see is the power of using motorsport to develop technology is we've taken something developed for automotive and doubled the power density. So ended up with a inverter at 230 kilowatts when it was originally 120. In parallel with all of this, we've worked with silicon carbide in Formula One since around 2012-2013. So our Gen 2 inverter was silicon carbide, our Gen 3 was silicon carbide. We then took that into Formula E, our Gen 4 inverter was silicon carbide. Um, and then we've taken all of this learning, we've used probably silicon carbide from most of the main providers. We've used all of the technology and learned which ones work, how they break, how you can push them and how you use them. And are taking all of that knowledge and putting it into our automotive inverter, an 800 volt silicon carbide automotive inverter for the reasons we've talked about before why we think the future of automotive is 800 volts and silicon carbide um, and again why why is 800 volts important well 800 volt gives you higher power throughput through the cables so that means you can charge faster so going back to my earlier slides about some of the barriers to entry being uh, charge anxiety how quickly can we charge when you go to 800 volts you halve that charging time and you start to compete at 800 volts with the sort of time it takes to fill a vehicle with petrol or diesel um, not quite but you're getting very very close to that sort of stoppage time um, so the end user benefits are reduced time at charging stations the big benefits and efficiency though come from silicon carbide with silicon carbide you get a higher switching frequency with higher switching frequencies you can start to optimize your drivetrain. You also get higher efficiency, but it's really the switching frequency that helps you optimize your drivetrain uh, in the best way possible. 
So you can start to get a smaller and lighter motor. So your motor will be higher, um, it will spin faster, it'll have a higher RPM, and therefore it'll be lower torque for the same power and smaller and lighter. That becomes important because when you get into volumes for, for automotive applications, the cost of the motor will tend towards the raw material costs. So if you have a smaller motor, it will cost less because there's less aluminium and copper and magnetics in that motor. So that becomes very important. Your inverter, of course, can become smaller. You have less cooling. You have smaller uh, capacitors. Your DC link capacitor can be smaller because your EMC will be less. Importantly, your battery will also be smaller. If you need less energy because you're more efficient, you have a smaller battery. And of course, the cooling system overall can be smaller because you start chasing efficiency. And when you start chasing efficiency, you need less cooling because you're generating less heat. And what we find is there's a virtuous cycle. So as you chase efficiency, things become smaller and become lighter. And then you become more efficient as a vehicle and then you need less energy. And so things can become smaller and lighter again. So really focusing on efficiency helps to get a better vehicle overall. So we see higher powertrain efficiency, typically a 60% reduction in cooling, but also a longer range. And some of the simulations we've done say you can expect to see a greater than 7% increase in EV range over the WLTP cycle. Those are the sorts of benefits. Now, 7% may not, may not feel like a lot, but with that 7% of your battery, the single biggest cost on the vehicle, that is a big deal. It's a very big deal. And so this brings us to the, the inverter that we are, we're showing here at the event today and what we have spent a lot of time developing. But it's a 800, 900 volt inverter, weighs five and a half kilograms um, and less than 3.8 litres in, in volume. Um, it, but developed for fully automotive applications, so 70 degree C max coolant, CAN interfaces, and all of the safety features you'd expect to see in an automotive application. So ISO 26262 to ACLD, uh, integrated H fills, active short circuit, uh, designed to EMC standards, but also utilizing Autozar as the base software for that. So fully designed for automotive applications. Um, and if you'd like to come and see that, we have a stand where you can come and see the inverter. Uh, later on today and really that's that's what I want to talk to you about the, the future of automotive drivetrains the the, the the battery is really important and a lot of people have spent a lot of time over the last few years developing batteries and focusing batteries to be as small and light and efficient as possible but that was the low-hanging fruit now it now the drivetrain becomes more important and the heart of the vehicle is the inverter because that defines the safety case, that defines the communications, that defines the architecture, that defines what sort of motor you can run. And so the inverter will become one of the most important components in the vehicle and therefore will really drive the future of automotive. And that, that's why we've developed our automotive inverter. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. I would like to welcome Giancarlo De Angelis, president of EM, EM Power. Uh, EM Power started uh, 10 years ago, very active in the development and uh, the promotion of control units for Formula One. I would like to let the speaker talk about that and uh, the high speed driver train for super sport car applications. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Giancarlo De Angelis. And I'm the president of uh, EM Power. I'll say before from Luca, EM Power was born in 2012 in the Bologna area. Upon the increase in demand of electric and electronic devices for automotive industry, EM Power founders have been developing their knowledge in design production and development of electronic device for automotive and motorsport application. Then, since the beginning of the hybrid era in Formula One, the company has been focusing on design and production of the electronic control units 
for cars and airs in Formula One cars. Nowadays, what is going on with our journey in the Formula One, we are taking advantage of our experience to design complex electronic architectures, including microcontrollers, DSP, and FPGA, with the main target of minimize the overall size. To develop electronic control units from design phase to production and testing of both PCBs and the mechanical housing. Develop inverters and e motors for electrified powertrains installed in supercar and other high performance applications. The Empower activities cover all aspects of the projects electric, electronics, and the mechanical design software implementation, thermal electromagnetic and the mechanical simulations, validation testing, production, customer support for product integration in the final applications. Our mission is a continuous specialization as winning strategy in the markets with a very high technology complexity. Continuous research activity to innovate and anticipate the market requirements. In design a cutting edge solution, tailored to the performance requirements, to the installation constraints, and to the expected lifespan of the device. Development and production of electronic control units like inverters, BMS, DC DC convert, etc., supporting motorsport electrification focus. Electric powertrains for high performance is vehicle with the emphasis on efficiency and the power density. Innovative solution to bring electrification where not yet arrived. The empowered staff is made on 35 employees, 14 in production, seven management and quality, 14 in research and development. In the markets in which Empower is operating, the goal of zero failure is fundamental. For this reason, all control, testing, and quality system operations are fundamental. To achieve these quality targets, Empower has invested in the state-of-the-art equipment, such as Climatic, ch climatic chambers for thermal evaluation and products. A thermal shock chamber that allows to go from minus 90 degrees up to 215 degrees in less than 20 seconds. An X-ray chamber used for tomographic analysis and PCB solder quality checks microscopes for visual checks, two model test bench equipped with a torque meter pose capabilities up to 30,000 RPM at 150 newton meters. The power limit is defined from the battery emulator system and then electric motor with power up to 250 kilowatts. The main battery emulator has a power of 75 kilowatt, voltage range 5 to 1,000 volt, and current limit plus minus 600 amps. Main configuration back to back, huh? the active motor consumes energy, while the one that breaks produces energy. The battery simulator is used only to recover lost performances. Our efficiency is not equal one, unfortunately. Electronic and mechanical assembly system computerized for a paperless production. The final test is operated on the 100% of our products. The Empower plant, uh, huh? the Empower plant Located in uh, San Giorgio di Piano, 20 kilometers northeast of Bologna, occupies approximately 1,000 square meters and includes warehouses, production line, 
and test laboratories, technical services and administrative offices, and prototype testing laboratories. Construction of second 2,100 square meter building is expected to be completed by mid-2023, which will be used to expand the electronic production department in which new test bench room will be installed to improve the testing capabilities. While a third building should be finished in 2025-2027 and it will be used for the production and the electromechanical equipments. As said previously, since from its foundation, the Empower has been involved in the design, development, and production of electronic system for motorsport. We are currently supplying control units for Formula One and other motorsport categories, and also other kinds of products, always related to the motorsport, like tire warmer for thermal blankets in Formula One, Voltage regulator for alternator for MotoGP motorcycle. Now we are in development an higher accurate current and voltage sensor for Formula One application to be used to monitor the electrical energy produced by the EL system, energy recovery system, and meet FI requirements and limitations on the recovered energy for each lap. Finally, here you can see our first generation on motor and inverter system for road car. To date, our target is sport cars and supercars, both in a niche market. To be competitive in these two markets, we need to develop systems of an intermediate range between motorsport and cars, road cars, and to achieve the trade-off between cost, weight, and size of the systems. To achieve this goal, we developed a first-generation system that allowed us to study and verify the feasibility of our goals. On 2015, the first generation of our system named the 100 key born as you can see, the big differences between the standard automotive system and the Formula One are the weight. You can see on the picture on the left, the standard automotive motor weight is more than 50 kilograms, while the Formula One motor weight is less than 10 kilograms. The cost, the cost is for the standard automotive is less than 2,000 euro, the indicative cost for Formula One is more than 200,000 euro. With our first generation system, one on the key, we achieved the weight less than 25 kilograms with cost less than 10,000 euro. We have chosen for our motor the IPM configuration, internal permanent magnet. For vehicle application, IPM technique provides big benefits compared to SPM motors. The IPM configuration allows more control over the magnetization and the magnetic circuit and allows to have a very wide constant torque range. With the magnets inside the rotor, we overcome most of the problem related to the centrifugal force acting on magnets, thus avoiding particular retainment system, bandage, carbon fiber, etc., necessary for SPM configuration motors. Therefore, the high operational rotation speed allows us to meet performance requirements in fairly small size and weight with the overall advantage for the vehicle architecture. On the other hand, this kind of motor architecture is quite difficult to drive at high performance and speed, and has forced us to develop highly performing electronics 
using state-of-the-art components derived from our Formula One experiences, such as FBGA architectures, implementing parallel calculation process that allow us to achieve a control site each four microseconds, corresponding at 250 kilohertz of work frequency. Starting from Warande key system and following the requests received from the market, we have created a second generation of systems. High voltage driver train, and mild hybrid driver train. This second generation, exploiting the skills of the Warande key system, has allowed us to obtain an high increase in performance as efficiency and energy density, which have allowed us to re drastically reduce the size and the weight of the e motor, and last but not least, the cost. The current system features are optimal for being easily installed on both the front or rear axle of a high performance car. Both are currently in production. <coughs> High voltage driver train. Uh, this motor represents a second generation of high voltage power motor with a voltage, supply voltage up to 450 volts. And as you can see, with the same maximum out power output, it weighs about half that of the previous generation. It's much smaller, so much so then can insert directly on the axle and the reach a rotation speed of 24,000 RPM. Here in the picture, you can see that the comparison dimension between the motor and the smartphone. The other project currently in production is a 48 volt system for a high performance mild hybrid car. This is a very low inductance motor, very difficult to be controlled with a fast utilization dynamics, and it requires a high frequency, a high current control of our inverter. This system assists the thermal combustion engines in all situations in which there is a torque demand, like starting from standstill, shifting and torque field, energy recovery during braking phase, etc. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giancarlo, for uh, being perfectly on time. Um, now I would like to check before we shift the, the speakers, if there is any question to, from the audience uh, on these uh, three presentations. No? I have... Ah, okay. Please. He's coming. Talking about the, the electric vehicle, the future of electric vehicle, what will be the desired life cycle or life, yeah, life expectancy of an electric vehicle? Yeah, it's a good question. How do you, you expect? Avoid that we have understand, but can you repeat in Italian? Because I am. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I don't speak Italian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will. I will. What is the expectation uh, about the future uh, life cycles of an electric vehicle? Uh, 
So, um, I, I guess my, my question would be, would you expect it to be any different to a conventional vehicle? So, you know, a conventional vehicle will be designed to last 10 years, 100,000 miles, something like that. There have been concerns that electric vehicles won't last as long because of the battery. But one of the things we're seeing now is actually the batteries outlast the vehicle, typically. Not in every case, of course, and there's always edge cases, but the the battery design is, is less of a worry. Um, so if anything, the life cycle of an electric vehicle will be the same as um, uh, a conventional vehicle today, or possibly when we look at different applications, possibly even longer. When we start looking at autonomous vehicles, when we start looking at commercial vehicles, actually there, there could be longer life cycles for electric vehicles. So I don't think the the idea that electric vehicles will have a shorter lifespan than conventional vehicles is is really going to be valid in, in at the moment in the near future if that was the question you asked i'm not sure yeah. any other question okay i have a couple of questions for you guys mm. stefano uh, giovanni sorry at the beginning, at the beginning of your speech, you said Rimac is getting too powerful for driving, and we see cars in the market coming, announcing 2,000 horsepower, and seems that the race is growing and so on. Why to develop those cars if it is so difficult to drive? <laughs> there is one real reason. Uh, Rimac, uh, Mate Rimac is a very clever guy. Okay, but also one driver, very fast. And he drive uh, his car in, uh, in drifting, normally in drifting, needs to have a power and shut up. Okay, first. Second is uh, easy to have 2,000 horsepower where you built your technology. In the end, uh, the choice of pretty much is to have more power than others in order to go in the market with a different approach. Then Lotus come, then McLaren, then, but the first is that, okay? Uh, the future for electrical vehicle is divided in two. The normal car selling, where the cost must go down, where the life cycle must change, the electrical car must not have fault and change the battery when it's necessary, necessary, and the, the very high cost of car, where the power, the performance is out of mind. There is no reason for to have this level of power, except, okay, go more forward compared to the AC traditional car. 1,000 horsepower is what Ferrari can do without problem. 2,000 is another story. That is a reason to sell the car at the double three time of cost. That is a reason. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And uh, Steve, my question is coming from my, from our several speech about uh, state of function. Okay. How state of function cope in your picture for the future of efficiency, considering the, your research, I mean, the research in general of top performances in the car. Of, of what, sorry? Top performances. So, uh, this sort of links back to the previous question. One, one of the um, criticisms of electric vehicles today is they're very one-dimensional. So they're very fast, they have a lot of acceleration, you put your foot down and it, it, it's good fun, but that's kind of it. You know, they, they, they aren't necessarily the most engaging of drives. They aren't necessarily the best to go around corners. They don't necessarily um, uh, ha have the right dynamic response. You know, um, engine designers have spent years and years and years working on throttle response, for example. We, we haven't done that in electric vehicles. One of the things we are finding with our new inverter technology is because that's come from motorsport, um, particularly in Formula One and Formula E, 
um, things like throttle response, things like dynamic response um, become very important. Um, and that's something that mainstream automotive hasn't hasn't really cottoned on to yet. So one thing we're seeing, and coming back a little bit to the previous question, is you can have 2,000 horsepower, but one of the reasons it may not be, and I, I don't want to talk for Remac, but one of the reasons it may not be um, that easy to drive is because actually it's not very controllable. But the more controllable you can make it, and that may well be through the new newer technology that's now available, silicon carbide, for example, higher switching frequencies, different motor topologies, um, will help with that. So making those vehicles more drivable um, we will we'll start to help um, and that's something we're seeing coming in now we're, we're seeing that as something that efficiency now is the big buzzword and I talked a lot about efficiency but I think drivability will come in after that and, and so the second half of your, your question was around state of function yes how, how it works uh, so uh, really when, when, when we have an inverter it's very much like um, very much like a battery in terms of state of function you know it will tell you how much um, how much power how much torque is available what how you can use it but of course being an automotive application it has to look at itself it has to have the sensors has to have the diagnostics um, to, to, to know reliably what you have in particular where you might have a high performance application you could have multiple motors per wheel and then state of function becomes very important because you need to know that if you ask for 300 newton meters on each each motors but they're on the same axle um but, but different wheels you need to know that you're going to get 300 newton meters plus or minus a couple of percent on each of those motors and so state of function becomes very important and tied in very much with the functional safety uh, concept so we do a lot of work to make sure that those those aspects are very reliable and robust Thank you very much. And I have another question for you, for Giancarlo. Uh, you are very focused on small-scale production, high-tech, high performances. How to cope with the cost? Because you mentioned that the cost is uh, one of the key factors for you. question because for us is a, a very important parameters but uh, uh, with the new technology that we are in development uh, um, one is uh, spoken before from um, Stefan um, the technology help us to reduce the cost and uh, technology as the electron, electronic technology, as the mechanical technology, because uh, we can use uh, new material and uh, to, we can have to focus uh, this parameter that in this moment is uh, really critical for us. For two reasons. One, because our production is not a mass production. And one, because uh, uh, our customer want always a customized uh, products. This is very important to be fast, of course, <laughs> and uh, it's difficult at the same time to reduce uh, dramatically the cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me introduce uh, John Paulides. He is uh, John. Uh, is the third generation of uh, a family that has developed the technology of powertrain, high-performance powertrain, I would say, starting from the ruins of Rotterdam port during the Second War. So I would like uh, to welcome him. And, uh, you know, electric vehicles are heavier than standard vehicles. So therefore, suspensions and the development of suspensions are getting more important to support all the coming weight. And John will explain us his technology. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bono. <laughs> 
Luca. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, attending my talk. It will be about uh, fully active suspension. But before I start with the fully active suspension, I would like to introduce also uh, our other product, which is a, a motor that integrates the power electronics. You can find it on the stand there. We also show it. We put it in a single package. Why we put it in a single package is because we want to make life easy. Yeah, so we want all problems and give you no problems. Yeah, so we take all the problems inside because we merge all the difficult components in a single package where we have the cooling, the power electronics and the motor. On the left you see a traditional powertrain, yeah, so with the controller, with all the CAN communication, with all the wires, and on the right you see our solution. The only thing we need from you is DC cables and maybe communication, if you want it. We can provide you with wireless communication, but we can also, of course, want, can supply you with wired application. So our solution is on the right, where a traditional solution is on the left, where you see all the cables, all the, all the trouble, all the problems, all the expensive, all the difficulty with connection, we will take care of for you. Yeah, so this is our solution. And tomorrow I have a very uh, long talk, about two hours, about the electric motors and state of the art. So also feel free to join that. That will be more into this area. Yeah, here you see it's further developed, yeah, so we can divide it, provide this from very small power, which is only like five kilowatt, all the way up to five megawatt. Yeah, so we can scale this up. We have a modular design where we use all the components and reuse them in order to scale this technology. We can provide water cooling, but we can also provide you with air cooling. Yeah, so it depends on your application. We don't have a catalog. We always listen to our customer. So our customer asks us a question, we listen, we digest, and we provide you with the solution. So it is not an extended catalog. You cannot buy our product directly from catalog. We will only supply to your specific need. So back to active suspension. What do I want? It's not important. What my wife wants is important. If we drive the car, she wants to drink a coffee, she wants to have a tea, she wants to be so comfortable as in front of the fireplace at home. Yeah, this is what she wants. What I want is to drive fast. Two wheels around the corner. Yeah, this is what I want, but not important. Yeah? But we try to make the combination of these two. Yeah, so what we try to combine is handling and comfort. Yeah, so these two things is something that active suspension can provide for you. Due to the higher voltages, as was shown before, so if we go from 12 volt to 48 volt to 400 volt to 800 volt, these kind of applications become more feasible. With 12 volt, these kind of applications are quite hard, quite difficult, because we need quite a lot of power to go back and forth. Yeah? So in 12 volt, it's quite difficult, but with 48 volt, we can do it. 48 volt, 400 volt, and 800 volts, we can provide. So electric vehicles also supply you the powertrain or the, the storage yeah, or the infrastructure in order to provide this. What do we do as a company? What we do as a company is to provide you with a, a corner solution that is shown on these four parts and we can provide you with the vehicle controller or you provide us with the vehicle controller. Because centralized control is not so common yet. Yeah, so usually people are looking at the corner in order to optimize, in order to have local control. What, what we prefer, of course, is a centralized vehicle controller, where the comfort and the handling of the car is centrally arranged. So not in each corner, not that we are fighting other systems. So not that we are fighting ABS, not that we are fighting ESP, not that we are fighting uncontrollable loads, not that we are fighting active steering, rear-wheel steering. Yeah? So this should, of course, be a combination of all in order to provide you with the best solution so that my wife can be very comfortable and I can drive very fast. So what do we provide as a company? We provide the active strut, suspension strut, which is at the top. We can provide you with a test rig. And with customers, we are looking for demonstration vehicles. So we are looking for vehicles, demonstrations, where we can actually illustrate our suspension technology. Yeah, so we are looking for partners 
that would like to do this with us. Yeah? So this is what we are looking for. We are developing the strut. We are developing the power electronics all in-house. Yeah? So everything is done in-house. We are developing the test rigs, but we are looking for concept demonstration vehicles. So what is active suspension? So maybe in the past we were driving with a horse carriage where we had some springs. Then people started with dampers. In the beginning they were leather and they were wettening the leather in order to go faster. Those were the first dampers in order to show that you can achieve comfort and you need a damper. Then the next level is hydraulic suspension. Next level air ride. Next level is semi-active dampers, but they are still only in two quadrants. And then you get a whole range of nothing, and then you get active suspension. Active suspension gives you completely new capabilities within your vehicle. You have never seen before. Yeah, so it will actually bring a next level of suspension. That's also why it is quite difficult for current T1 suppliers to develop this technology. Because it devo the, the, the technology is completely different. We have been working on this technology from 1998. So it has been 25 years in the making. So it has not come overnight. Actually, there's a lot of research and development that went into this technology. It is very difficult. It is quite a next step, next level. So here we can see a small comparison of the technology. I think it's quite difficult to read, uh, but it shows here that if you have the vertical axis, you see energy efficiency. On the horizontal axis, you see bandwidth. And bandwidth means how fast can I react? So how fast can I react to some other input? And you see here that the comparison of the different technologies, where passive suspension is on the left top, and active suspension is on the right top still, uh, but it's moving down. Yeah, it is moving down in both energy efficiency and uh, bandwidth in order to be cost comparative. Yeah, so of course, in the end, for mass production, we also have to look at cost. Cost is important, but because of different vehicles in the future, so we have, of course, the high performance vehicles, but we also have the robot taxis. Yeah, we didn't hear a lot about this, but robot taxis means you go into a vehicle and you don't look. Yeah? This will make everybody sick. Yeah? If you do not look at the road, do not have a steering wheel, you will get motion sickness. Yeah? So then comfort and active suspension because of utmost importance. Yeah? So at that moment, everybody will look at this technology because this is something that's really necessary. And also when you look at skateboards, skateboard meaning we have the battery in the middle, centralized, and we have only four corners. We do not want an anti-roll bar that goes from the left vehicle to the right vehicle. We don't want this anymore. This is really a nightmare for packaging. Yeah, we actually want the corners to be individual. Our active suspension means we don't need roll bar anymore. Anti-roll bar can be disappear. Yeah, you don't need it. So you don't need the compromise between lateral uh, and jaw and pitch. And you don't need this this compromise anymore, you can develop them individually. Of course, your controller needs to be very, very accurate and needs to be very, very up to the task of actually giving you the handling and the comfort at the same time. So if we look at the road, why do you need high frequency? So why do you actually need this? Well, we made an analysis of a pothole and a pothole is basically a hole in the road and it is like a square function. So you drive the road and suddenly the road disappears and it comes back. And so it's like a square, a square wave. If you make a Fourier analysis of this, so if you do a harmonic decomposition of this square wave, you will see that there is a lot of harmonics in this waveform. So a square wave, of course, the ideal square wave, has infinite number of harmonics. Yeah, you need an infinite number of harmonics, summation of it, in order to come to the square wave. So what we do is we decompose it. We decompose this square wave and we show that we can also handle the high frequency that is required in order to compensate for this pothole. Now with, with our technology, you can actually pull the wheel. Yeah, so you can pull the wheel from the pothole. This is possible. You can pull the wheel before the ramp is coming. So to actually anticipate. 
Yeah, but you can also react while, so you can make a combination with cameras, or you can have just the system work on its own. Because we are so high frequent, yeah, we have a high bandwidth. Yeah, we don't need sensors. Yeah, we have only little sensors necessary in order to compensate for it. Here I show that yeah, if we look at the quarter car setup, so we have the unsprung mass at the bottom. First we have the road, then we have the spring, then we have the unsprung mass, then we have the components, suspension components, and we have the body. So we have a dual mass, a second order system. And so we have the unsprung mass and we have the sprung mass. And here you see all the different components that we consider. And if we look at that in the frequency domain, what we see is, for instance, if we take the 1.5 hertz. In 1.5 hertz, this is what will happen. I think. Oh. It's not working. I don't have the animation. The animation doesn't work. It doesn't matter. It is not animating. Ah, I'm sorry, but I don't know. Maybe. Okay. So what I show is, it doesn't matter. It there's normally an animation here on the right showing the different characteristics of this unsprung mass. What you see in the frequency domain, so in the frequency domain we have frequency and we have the gain. And of course we want to be as low as possible in order to damp all the vibrations that come from the road to the sprung mass. Here you see that with a soft damper, you have the highest gain. With the medium damper, you have the medium gain. And with the red, with the soft damper, you have the best isolation from the road to the sprung mass. So to the body, you have the best isolation. If we go up in frequency, what you will see is, uh, you don't see it, but uh, it's animated normally. You see that suddenly the soft damper becomes the highest gain and the, oh sorry, yeah, the soft damper becomes the lowest gain and the stiff damper becomes the highest gain. So they are, vi uh, they, they change position. So it's very difficult if you are making a passive suspension to make a compromise because you want a soft damp or a stiff damper at low frequency and a soft damper at high frequency. To make this combination is very complicated. And if we go even higher frequency to 15 hertz, where we are in the real axis resonance, you will see that actually all points are on top of each other. We call this invariant points. That means whatever you do, whatever your controller is trying to do, nothing will happen. You know, nothing is happening whatsoever. So here we show the Bode diagram. Yeah, so we show if we have a soft damper and a soft spring, this is your characteristic over the frequency domain. If you have a little bit soft damper and stiff spring, what will happen is at low frequency, you will have less, yeah, so you will have more problems, but at very low frequency where you have the motion sickness, you will have a less gain, so it will be better. If you go to a stiff damper and a soft spring, you see that all the resonances are basically smoothed out, yeah, but you will see that in the average level between five and eight hertz where you have organs that are starting to vibrate, yeah, you will see that you have a higher gain. So actually making a compromise for a passive suspension is very difficult. What we can do yeah, is, this is also with tire formation. So the first one was comfort, now we talk about handling. Handling means the tire has to stick to the road as much as you can. We call this tire deformation. So tire deformation is the force you are putting back. Here also you see the same compromise between all the different uh, signals and you see that it's very difficult to succeed in a compromise in a passive suspension. We still have these invariant points. So how to remove these constraints? Well, we have four components in suspension technology. We have the tire, we have the spring, we have the damper, and also like we have an inerter, which is also in Formula One sometimes used. It is resisting acceleration. We call it an inerter. What we provide you is an extra. We call it electric motor. And this electric motor has the advantage that is not dependent on any states. So you decide. Hey, you do not want the road to decide. You decide. And your controller decides whether it provides you a force or not. Yeah? This is what you can do. Here you see that with our suspension, you can significantly improve. Yeah, already with quite a lot, a little energy, 
you can provide a very much improvement to the conventional vehicles. So here you see that if you have a stiff damper, if you have a soft damper, if you have a medium damper, what we can provide you, both in road holding and in comfort, we can provide you with a significant gain. So this is what we can do as a company. What we can do to you is basically to show you that we can do this. Uh, and that's basically my talk of today, is to thank you for this. Uh, we can provide you with a significant gain using our active suspension technology. And what we are looking for is demonstration vehicles. So partners that would like to develop with us demonstration vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. And uh, allow me to introduce Daniele Severi, that is the Advanced Simulation Technology Sales Manager for AVL. We will talk with him about uh, simulation and uh, what else AVL, that is the largest engineering company and uh, for the development of powertrain from endothermic engines up to hybrid as well as to the electrification vehicles. For your kind introduction, so very quickly I guess you all know ABL which is the world largest independent company for development, testing and simulation of uh, automot in the automotive field but also in other sectors and we are also active in many other innovative fields like autonomous driving, software, cyber security, data management and virtualization. So in Italy we have two main locations, I'm located in Reggio Emilia, the other one is in uh, uh, Turin. And in today's presentation I would like to, let's say, discuss a little bit uh, some capabilities of simulation along the vehicle development process. So you all know that in new vehicles we have increased complexity due to the additional components. For example, uh, we have multiple control units, so a software layer, and these multiple control units are interacting each other and with the hardware. So when we analyze the system, we need to consider the interaction with uh, the thermal domain, the electric domain, and the mechanical uh, components. In addition to the system complexity, we need to consider that in order to satisfy the legislation and yeah, the requirements of the market, we need also additional testing. So for example, we need to test the integration of all these components. We need to test them in real driving conditions to understand how the system works uh, in the real uh, usage. So this means a lot of additional millage, for example. Uh, we need to deal with multiple variants and uh, also we need to consider the additional uh, requirements to legislations also for safety and diagnostic requirements. So when we combine this together, obviously we, we end up in additional cost and time, both for the testing phase and for the, let's say, concept phase. So that's why simulation is crucial in both sides to support the development, to reduce cost and time. So just focusing, for example, on a key component in the electrification, so let's assume the battery pack. We start uh, usually analyzing the system in system simulation approach. So we simulate the entire vehicle. We select in this way according to the required expectation of, of the vehicle. Uh, the proper architecture, we try to compare different concepts. And uh, once we have the main requirements, we uh, use the re these requirements to go on a uh, lower level, so we move into the requirements of subassemblies and components. So just uh, sticking on the example of battery pack, we identify, for example, which is the energy that must be stored, which are the currents, the powers, and the voltage of the system. And finally, we use simulation also uh, from this point to correctly choose, for example, the um, number of cells in series in parallel, or also to uh, select the proper cell chemistry. And in order to do this, obviously you need uh, to have, for example, for the chemistry, uh, proper input data. So it's crucial to have uh, the proper input data or at least reliable models, because without reliable models, uh, yeah, everything is useless. And finally, uh, if, if we reach this goal, we can go back and perform a virtual validation of the system from simulation, uh, yeah, already from the concept phase, let's say. So in order to get uh, input data, we have mainly two opportunities. So the first one is we start from experiments. 
So if we think of um, the batteries uh, of the cell, for example, the first opportunity would be we have to test our cells. And if we want to simulate the electrical and um, uh, thermal behavior, typically we start from some uh, standard tests, for example, the hybrid pulse power characterization, and we obtain uh, the equivalent RC model of our cell uh, with a dedicated procedure. We also have parameterized the, the workflow. The alternative, so if we don't have the measurements or if we don't have the data sheet from our supplier, would be to rely on uh, some kind of databases. And that's why we have developed a partnership with Batimo, which is a company that has tested a lot of cells in the market and has developed uh, electrochemical models for many available cells in the market. And here you can see that they have validated the, the, their models uh, from different uh, temperature range from 0 to 50 C of current and uh, also in dynamic, uh, in dynamic conditions in order to get a reliable model that can be used already in the concept phase when we don't have the data. Then, okay, the, the, the next step is clear. We, we get the data of the cell, uh, we, identify, we know the requirements of the pack, and then, uh, yeah, we specify obviously the cell characteristics and we have a procedure let's say, to correctly define which are the number of cells in series in parallel. We estimate the weight and the characteristics of the pack. And finally, we check uh, already virtually if the first design is uh, uh, sufficient or not. So basically, in our workflow, we start from cell, we move into module, and finally, we go into pack and integration in the vehicle. Uh, here, there should be a video that is not uh, working, but it's basically a car um, on the track, in, on the Nürburgring. Um, okay, basically, yeah, um, we simulate uh, the dynamic of the car and we simulate also, you see below, uh, how the battery system or the entire vehicle and the energy flow uh, is, uh, yeah, sorry. yeah, it's not working. This one? Yes, but it's no problem. Yeah, it's just a video of, you know, vehicle dynamics. Okay. Yeah, the, the key point here is that if you have reliable models, uh, you can see maybe on the bottom right that uh, in the uh, violet curve, you have the anode potential estimation. So anode potential estimation is a value that can be obtained only with electrochemical models and gives you an idea if we are uh, inducing some kind of lithium plating phenomenon, so some kind of aging to the, to the vehicle. So in cold conditions, in extreme conditions, with simulation, we can understand if our control strategy is uh, somehow uh, in favor of aging the, the, the battery. So we can take, uh, obviously, uh, counter measurements in order to avoid, for example, here at the beginning of the cycle, uh, that uh, our battery is damaged. Uh, or we can also check uh, the temperature, optimize uh, the thermal management, and so on. Another example, similar to the previous one, but more focused on the fast charging. So now we are looking at some uh, key um, applications. So also fast charging is crucial uh, when we develop controls and uh, accurate simulation are important to uh, front load the development already in an early stage. So if we look at the plot, we see that we have uh, five plots that are representing the five physical limits of the fast charging process. So at the beginning, at the, in, at the, in, the first, uh, in the first slide, we see that the, we have a limitation in the power of the grid. And at the beginning of the uh, fast charging process, the second line, uh, we are able to charge uh, the vehicle or the, the, the battery pack with the maximum allowed uh, uh, current. So this is limited by the, the, by the charger. Then, uh, since we have a physical model, we can estimate that the temperature is increasing during the charging, and we have an additional limit to avoid the temperature-induced aging, so we need to derate the current. Finally, we have, uh, okay, we, we continue in charging. We have another limitation, which is caused by this uh, anode potential that is dropping, and that should not go below zero. So we limit once again our strategy in order to avoid that uh, anode potential is dropping below zero. And finally, the last limitation is that, uh, yeah, we don't, uh, we need to mm, yeah, basically get an, uh, a constant value of the voltage. So the final limitation is related to the voltage of the cell. So if we are able in simulation to have reliable models and to track all these five limits, we can already 
check uh, also in office or in hardware in the loop our control strategy. Another point uh, which is coming with the regulation uh, is the safety of uh, the vehicles. Here I still keep the example of the battery pack. So with the new GTR 20 regulation, if you detect a thermal runaway, then the passenger needs to have at least five minutes in order to escape, uh, safely escape from the vehicle. So you have an in, um, uncontrolled release of energy from one cell and before everything is getting uh, yeah, uh, on fire, you need to leave, uh, leave the car. Um, obviously we need to support this kind of test uh, uh, from the simulation perspective because when you obviously need to test this and uh, pass the regulation, obviously you need to destroy your components. That is a prototype, you're very expensive. So you obviously need to um, yeah, uh, pass the test at the, at the first attempt. And in order to do this, we start from the, uh, let's say, over typically overheating a test of a single cell. As you can see here, uh, we start increasing the temperature of the cell until we reach uh, a couple of critical points where slow thermal runaway and fast thermal runaway are occurring. On the right side, you see that when thermal, uh, uh, fast thermal runaway starts, you have a sudden increase in the temperature, a lot of heat rejection from the, ch from the cell, and this heat could uh, move towards our other cells, and if other cells are reaching the activation temperature, they also start to go in uh, fast thermal runaway. So you have a first release of energy from one cell, if the heat, uh, uh, if the temperature of the cells in the neighbor is increased, uh, is increased uh, uh, in order to reach this threshold, then you have a, a, a cascade effect, let's say, and other cells are starting to go in thermal runaway. And it's a propagation and it's for sure what we want to avoid or control at least. And for this, uh, yeah, the two main approaches are uh, system simulation. If you want to quickly check uh, the limits of your system, quickly compare different layouts and uh, materials or detailed simulations if you need to really have a, an insight of the components. And if you have, uh, let's say, a consistent workflow, the results are similar. Obviously, the level of detail is different, but uh, in a different stage, you will use the right approach. So just uh, with this example, I would like to conclude um, saying that simulation can be used to generate and compare uh, at the beginning different uh, vehicle architectures and to get the requirements for the component. We need to get reliable data and we usually update the models based uh, on the data that we have, testing data or we access to database when we don't have the data. We check through simulation already in a concept phase the performance of our component and monitor the main KPIs. And finally, obviously, we test in simula virtually, we virtually test uh, our vehicle and our components in uh, real driving conditions or at least uh, in conditions imposed by the legislation. And that's it. So there's quite a lot uh, to do. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniele. Very sure. Perfectly on time. Yeah, very good. And I have some questions for you okay. later. Perfect. Later, later. <laughs> Next, I would like to invite to the to speak, uh, Mr. John Michel Hugo. Uh, Finally, we will have to we will talk about uh, heat exchanger, thermal runaway, therm, uh, sorry, thermal management, uh, more than solutions. Jean-Michel is the CEO of uh, Temisht, that is a company that I don't really have a clue, so I will learn uh, what your company is doing. I will leave you to talk about yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thermal management and the strategy for the thermal management is one of the key points for electric vehicles. My question to, to John, in the meantime they are setting, is better thermal homogeneity in the battery pack or better avoid, in general, the thermal uh, runaway temperatures, uh, even sacrificing a little bit the homogeneity of the, of the battery pack? Uh, I will, uh, I will uh, let you 
which one answer the question? <laughs> It's not working, okay. Uh, I will let you answer the question because uh, what we do is to answer as the best as possible for our customer. So if it is the homogeneity that is needed, we can work on the homogeneity. If it is uh, minimal temperature, on the minimal temperature. So it depends. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're so uh, to introduce uh, Temist, uh, so Temist is a small company uh, located in the uh, southeast of France uh, in a technical center called uh, Team Henri Fab. Team is uh, for technology and expertise in advanced manufacturing processes. So the, the um, topic of my presentation is to talk about thermal management and the use of advanced manufacturing processes for, the, for this thermal management. So about about Temist. Um, so Temist is uh, about ten engineers specialized uh, in advanced manufacturing and thermal simulation. Uh, we gather experts in thermal components, thermal simulation, um, mechanical simulation, but also experts in advanced manufacturing process. So. What is advanced manufacturing process? The first one uh, is um, additive manufacturing, uh, so 3D printing for, for uh, most commonly uh, called. Uh, and we will speak also about uh, friction steel welding, that it's not a new um, technology, but a relative new in uh, combination with additive manufacturing. So we are specialized in design, first of all, uh, so to answer your question, is design uh, the recommend depend on the customer. We only do customized solution. So uh, depending on your needs, uh, as it's already um, said in the presentation before, uh, we digest, we we, get, we gather your needs, we digest it, and we propose you a customized uh, solution using advanced manufacturing systems, and we're also able to make testing and pre-qualification tests. Um, In-house, we are able to make also customized tests. We have the capacity of developing a customized uh, test loop for thermal and hydraulic performances. And a new challenge uh, for us is to become a small supply, a sp supplier of small batches of uh, thermal solutions. Um, I will introduce it uh, after because we, we believe that there is a challenges in uh, making something uh, customized, uh, but not in big uh, big series. Um, so uh, yeah, to speak about our main activity domain, uh, we work mainly from space and aeronautics application uh, in France, and in also in defense, so also mainly in France uh, at this time. Uh, also little bit in transport, uh, in the past we were working for automotive application, but not in electric application, in thermal application for conformal uh, cooling of uh, die casting mold. Um, and since uh, the COVID crisis in France, we start to work uh, for electrification uh, in the need of customized coal plate. Uh, so we transfer uh, what all we uh, develop for aerospace application to uh, automotive application. Um, transport, so it's already, and energy, energy and oil and gas, it's mainly for high pressure and high temperature. Uh, it's exchanges. Uh, so as I already said, uh, we are based in Marignan, close to Marseille, in southeast of France. Uh, we mainly operate in France, England, and Germany nowadays. Uh, and we have a representative office in Dusseldorf. So our team is um, specialized in, uh, in three main domains. Uh, fluid and thermal application, we have uh, eight engineers, four PhD. Uh, um, that work on the first part of uh, specific simulation, uh, thermal simulation of um, uh, non-common simulation of uh, 3D and thermal uh, transfer. We also work, for example, with uh, supercritical CO2, uh, methane, uh, all non-common application and non-common thermal simulation. Uh, and as I already told, we are uh, located in Timari Fab. Timari Fab is, uh, how to say it, it's a cluster. It's not, um, uh, it's a, uh, like an industrial fab lab. So there are several companies uh, that uh, gather 
um, material, so we have easy access to additive manufacturing machine, for example, that are set it by another company. Uh, and so this company is Airbus Helicopters, for example, that provide us uh, the, uh, easy access to additive manufacturing machine. And in our side, we are also uh, we have in-house uh, CNC machine with friction steel welding head uh, to make assembly. So uh, at this time, our main activity is uh, services. So uh, since 10 years, we provide services uh, to big company in their innovative development. Uh, so the first activity is thermal design. So in, when we speak about thermal design, thermal simulation, but also uh, the mechanical design and the CAD design. Uh, for this, we have classical software like uh, Solidbox, but also uh, innovative software like Entopology. Uh, Entopology is a software that uh, uh, allowed to make uh, generative and organic um, uh, shape uh, uh, based on mathematical approach. So we can modify a mathematical fields or a mathematical solution um, by um, result obtained by simulation. Uh, the second one is uh, mechanical design. So mechanical design is uh, the second more important point in heat exchangers for uh, modeling, for example, burst, uh, burst test. Uh, and also uh, take into account uh, the advanced manufacturing process. So for example, um, since 10 years, we gather knowledge in how to design a part for additive manufacturing without uh, working directly on additive manufacturing machine. Uh, and we're also able to choose what is the best uh, manufacturing systems to, to work with, uh, depending on the needs of the customer. Manufacturing, manufacturing with, uh, we have, you have two pictures, so sorry, small picture in, uh, in additive, uh, mainly in additive manufacturing. If you want to, to, to know more about the parts, we, are, we have a booth, C38, uh, where you can observe directly the, the parts, uh, the physical parts. And uh, finally, the test. And as I already mentioned, the challenge now uh, is uh, how to come from prototype to uh, serial production with advanced manufacturing process. So uh, what, why we are here today is um, because uh, we know that the world is facing a major crisis uh, in electric in energy supply, and that uh, we we believe that electrification uh, and hydrogen are um, a very good solution to um, come back to Europe. Uh, um, the, the energy supply in, uh, but also uh, it needs us to uh, facing again thermal challenges for hydrogen or for electrification. Despite the efficiency, there is uh, heat to, to 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 release to outside the main the main system. So uh, our main application here it's uh, for electrification, but also for what we call high value components. When there is high temperature, high pressure, uh, and specific fluid like CO2, uh, hydrogen, or, or methane. And also maybe uh, molding, uh, because we used to develop uh, conformal cooling for die casting uh, mold using additive manufacturing and to provide specific shape uh, in order to, to have, for example, in this case, homogeneity of temperature uh, on the mold. Here you have some uh, uh, some example of cold plate. So here it's just picture, but on the booth you can uh, see the real part. Uh, so customized cold plate by uh, by uh, CNC, uh, additive manufacturing. Um, what is interesting here, uh, this one which is not on the booth, so I will explain you. It's uh, uh, it's uh, it exchanges for high pressure and high temperature for oil and gas application. This one is uh, specific heat exchangers developed for uh, aeronautic application for gas gas uh, heat exchangers for um, air, uh, air control on uh, aircraft. Uh, so it's high temperature and uh, not high temperature, high difference temperature because on one side uh, the air is taken on the um, compressor of the of the engine and the other side of the outside the aircraft so there is about uh, uh, five in, uh, 500 degrees of difference between each side uh, and it was made for we can say it for liberal aerospace 
So uh, I would like to talk very shortly about the technology because I know that is the time to lunch also. <laughs> and um, so the, the two main technology that we use is uh, additive manufacturing and friction, friction steel welding. So what is additive manufacturing? Is a way to create a specific shape by addition of materials. So the main application we use in additive manufacturing is um, uh, uh, SLM, not, not SLM solutions of brown, but the SLM process. So uh, by adding powder and by melting the powder by a laser, we can create a specific shape and had uh, step by step uh, create the, 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 the complex shape. So it's allow us to make hollow structures, mainly heat exchangers is hollow structures, uh, and to make it in a specific way to, to uh, make a customized part to, um, to improve the integration, uh, but not making something in a cube. Classical heat exchangers, uh, classical process of heat exchangers, it's a cube. With additive manufacturing, on the, on the top here you have an example. You have to see the real part to, to understand it. It's a double curvature shape. So you can imagine to uh, put it where there is no place uh, or make as integration of the part in an already existing uh, mechanical part. The second technology we use is friction steel welding. What is friction steel welding? It's a way to make an assembly of parts uh, um, of two different alloy of aluminum or two different materials uh, without reaching high temperature. Uh, friction steel welding, the name is uh, explain what is it, is you make a friction of, uh, it's uh, seated on a CNC machine, you make a mix of materials without increasing too much the temperature, and by mixing the materials and uh, reaching enough temperature to have, uh, how to say it, uh, like a paste of the material, you make a mix of two, uh, two different alloy, and after uh, the cooling process, you have something um, like a classical welding. And the main advantage of that is that you can weld two different materials with two different temperature of uh, melting, two, two, two different melting temperature. For example, two different aluminum alloy, or copper and aluminum, or stainless steel and aluminum. And why uh, it is relatively new, it's about, uh, it is a 30 years technology, but uh, since uh, some years now, you can find new uh, way of uh, setting uh, friction steel welding on CNC machine that decrease sharply the price of friction steel welding. And what is interesting is to make a hybridization of additive manufacturing and uh, classical uh, processes like milling by making the assembly of uh, 3D parts with a milled part or casted part uh, using friction steel welding. So if I summarize about the use of the two, the two, um, the two technology, additive manufacturing is very good for high performance heat exchangers. When I speak about high performance is to find uh, uh, I, yeah, two minutes. Uh, high, high performance in small volumes, uh, but we have a uh, main problem with available materials nowadays. Uh, we have a main problem about to come from prototype to mass series production. Uh, and the main, um, main advantage is monolithic part and easy integration, but for very high exp expensive price. Uh, with friction steel welding, we know that is very good for less than 1,000 parts per, per year or, or, or total series. So it is about uh, 0.1 euro per meters of welding line. So it's, uh, you can create a specific cold plate uh, and a customized cold plate at a very cheap price and making an assembly or specific function for uh, using additive manufacturing. For example, for uh, uh, space or defense, defense application, we create new function, for example, for, store, for storing energy, or just to use a big cold plate, and at one point just use additive manufacturing to set a specific structure that allowed to make intensification of, uh, of, of the heat transfer. 
And here you have an example of uh, hybrid coal plate. So it's just picture. If you came on the booth, you can see real parts. Here's an example of an assembly of a specific coal plate with, for example, four parts made in copper or made in classical copper extrusion or maybe made in uh, 3D printing copper. Yeah, and here uh, some panel of uh, of one uh, of some of our customer. Uh, so, and again, I invited you to visit our booth. It's not very uh, far from uh, here in the C uh, C38, uh, and contact us if you have any uh, any more question about the use of friction steel welding and lithium manufacturing, and uh, if you have any needs in uh, thermal components customization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Thank you very much for your interesting technology. Um, yeah. And uh, our last speaker for this section is uh, Giuliano Elena, engineer Giuliano Elena. And uh, he will talk with us about the battery components within an electric vehicle. Morge, I'm very curious. Uh, Giuliano spent 10 years experience in the UK and just joined Podium Engineering, Podium Advanced Technologies now, uh, which in my opinion is one of the most interesting uh, uh, realities in the Italian uh, panorama for the uh, electrification market. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bono, for the introduction. Um, today, we would like just to discuss about our recent experience uh, with uh, EV vehicle architecture and mainly in detail about batteries. Before to start, I will just to give you some Some key facts about Podium and just a brief introduction. Podium has been founded in 2012 and is an engineering company based in the Valle d'Aosta region and was born with a very strong motorsport background. Was born in, uh, was founded in uh, 2012 uh, with a strong uh, motorsport uh, background, uh, and then since then has supported the many uh, several customers on endurance uh, competition such as uh, uh, WEC and uh, 24 Hour of Nurburgring, and uh, in the last six seven years. Uh, has developed several battery system application. Just to give a little bit of introduction uh, of the different business unit, there is a business unit with road cars responsible for resto mode, uh, uh, such as the um, Lancia Delta Futurista that has been launched a couple of years ago, hybrid and electric powertrain, supercars, platform development, battery system with a property BMS uh, system designed and programmed in-house, high voltage testing, battery manufacturing, and custom, custom battery packs. And then racing and motorsport with uh, racing cars fully developed in-house, assembled and uh, racing program with support of the the complete com co competition on, uh, with the, to the customer. Today we will just want to just discuss about experience on uh, how to move from uh, vehicle attributes, uh, understand uh, the uh, electric EV architecture, so from uh, what they could be vehicle attributes uh, in terms of performance, in terms of mass, of estimated mass of the vehicle, and then the charging times, all those are really key element to start the, the design and the costing of a vehicle. After that, starting from all the, the, those elements, there is the sizing of the element and the, 
understand the vehicle torque and power that is required, then then it gets translated to power pack requirements. So that is a very strong balance between the battery and EDU. Element for batteries such as uh, uh, capacity, peak power, peak current, power, and then packaging and weight. And everything needs to work together within a selected operating voltage that is key for the application. Uh, an example of uh, battery development uh, will start from uh, looking at the requirement identified in the previous slide, uh, having a cell that uh, tested and characterized with uh, several uh, methods and uh, models, then uh, understa having an understanding of the thermal uh, condition in where the cell will work in the application, and then all of that uh, design within packaging and weight restriction of the architecture or the vehicle. Then we have the possibility to have a prototype build where in conjunction with that there is the um, uh, validation and uh, simulation of the BMS, then validation and then testing and then we can start with the battery production just to have uh, a little bit of uh, more deep dive on the battery and understand why the battery is uh, such a key part in a EV architecture I want just to start about the efficiency and uh, mainly about uniform temperature distribution we know that uh, maintaining a uniform temperature distribution within the module or the pack it's key because first of all when we have a delta t within a cell that will lead to not uniform loads and higher cell degradation while on a, uh, if we have a delta t on a series of string cells connected in series that will limit the power delivery module capacity and the module capacity will be limited to the highest temperature cell then in uh, when we have a cell connected in uh, parallel we know that a delta t will just lead to not uniform current loss and higher cell degradation so it's key to understand uh, the temperature and how they are uh, located within the, the module that uh, so will help uh, with understanding the, the charge and discharge profile to select the correct cooling system design. In terms of performance, uh, a key activity is the selection of uh, the cell, cell chemistry and four factors. Internally, we have the possibility to, to to select the cell, characterize them on the test bench and, uh, and virtually with models, and then have the possibility to uh, select them, concept them, and uh, do some uh, module, different design option with different cell configuration and cell different module configuration. Uh, another important uh, factor in the performance or efficiency of uh, uh, a battery is how the singular cell are connected to bus bar or collectors. Uh, there we have experience on uh, ultrasonic wire bonding that for some application is a, vibe, is a good uh, technology but then some brings some limitation with it. So there are some profile of charge and discharge that they are critical with wire bonding and they, they can have electrical resistance that they cannot be trans, tra, they, they are quite important. So with resistance comes heat generation. Therefore, there are some application when a laser welding 
connection is required between bus bar and cell to increase the connection area to facilitate the, 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 the exchange of current and then to reduce the um, generation of heat. Other aspect, uh, other challenge in the battery development is uh, uh, making sure that uh, all the safety issues are thought of and that they are included within the design. When we talk about safety issues, we can have, we, they can be differentiated in three different, in three different macro categories. Mechanical abuse, electrical abuse, and thermal abuse. Mechanical abuse comes into uh, equation when there is a collision, when there are unexpected forces that they need to be absorbed by the battery pack or they get to the cell. Uh, so there do, it's, a, it's a paramount that during the design uh, all those uh, factors are taken in consideration, making sure that uh, even during uh, a crash or a side pole test, uh, the, 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 the force that they arrive to the cell, they are controlled and, uh, and uh, in order to make a, a safe system. Then there is electrical abuse that uh, where overcharge of over star or even external short, so short circuit can come to play and uh, that needs to be supported with uh, a system and uh, such as the BMS that can control, monitor, balance the, the module, the pack and making sure that uh, all those uh, safety factors are, uh, are covered and uh, um, included. Then the la uh, uh, another, another key factor is uh, packaging and weight. Uh, uh, the battery, the cells, uh, they bring a lot of uh, weight uh, that uh, that needs to be distributed within the, the packaging restriction. The weight needs to be taken is strongly in consideration during the, the simulation of how the vehicle will react. And then you know, there is a strong um, push to have very light system uh, a very energy dense system. So here we have uh, a few applications that uh, they, they have uh, re recently developed and uh, assembled in podium. We have uh, for motorsport, uh, application for motorsport, uh, for tramway, for marine and other special uh, uh, application. Um, so, just the last few words, we would like just to discuss about uh, the new headquarters that where we are going to move uh, by the end of the year. Uh, it's this new headquarters will have uh, a new part uh, um, allocated for battery assembly for uh, to allocate a production of up to 1,000 battery packs per year. Okay. okay thank you thank very you much. It was very interesting. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Time for lunch, eh? But I have a question for Daniele. Sorry, just one question. I uh, In your simulation, what is the level of approximation that you are applying on the cell? Okay, so it, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So we have four, I would say at least three main different uh, approaches. So in the easiest approach, so we have a neat rejection coming from literature, then we have RC equivalent model, and this is the, the, the level of detail depends on, first of all, the accuracy of the test and the ability to approximate uh, 
the electrochemical behavior with uh, RC equivalent models. So it can be easily checked uh, comparing uh, the fitting with experimental data. Finally, the third approach, which is the electrochemical one with Batimo, it's, there's a tolerance, so it's a strict tolerance. I would say, if I remember well, uh, they are validated in a transient behavior. Uh, temperature is uh, in the range plus minus three or five degrees, I would say, in the transient behavior. And uh, also electrochemical uh, accuracy, I mean, if we use this approach, there's a report for each cell describing uh, for uh, all the state of charge, temperature, and so on, which is the accuracy uh, between their uh, reproduced model and, uh, and, um, and the experiments. For sure, ex if we try to simulate, for example, thermal runaway, or if we rely on experimental data, it's crucial to have, first of all, a good uh, uh, procedure for the testing, because the testing is then uh, processed to get the input data. And then if you have a good test, uh, then you can also get the good input data for your models. Uh, because uh, you mentioned in your, uh, mm -hmm. in your speech that you can predict the aging for uh, a battery. Not for a battery. the aging. Okay. Maybe it was wrong. We can uh, predict some parameters which are inducing the aging. So we cannot say that, uh, I mean, there are semi empirical ways, but there is not a real prediction that working in this condition, your battery will last. Uh, I don't know, 10, I don't know, some, some number of cycles. You can simply say your anode potential is dropping, then in this condition you are having, a, you, are, you have the tendency to create lithium plating, so some kind of aging. So you can reduce the risk to induce the aging, but not directly evaluate uh, how much aging. Okay. So maybe this to clarify. <laughs> Thank you very much, okay. Daniele. Uh, I would say to have a little break for quick lunch and uh, we will start the section at two o'clock so 15 minutes to go thank you very much to everyone